ان الحمد لله احمده واستعينه واستغفره واستهديه واعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار a couple of days ago we all heard the news about the attempt to assassinate uh, the novelist or the writer the british writer uh, salman rushdi and it it went viral uh, salman rushdi as perhaps everyone knows uh, is an indian born uh, from a fam from a, pr probably most likely from a muslim family uh, born in india emigrated to britain and became british uh, and he became a very well known writer of his time in 1988 he authored his fourth novel by the title of Satanic Verses, in which he talked very disrespectfully and, of course, wrongfully about Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the words of Allah, the Quran. He did a lot of uh, exaggeration and imagination and, and all those. Uh, you know, factual kind of uh, stories, and it actually brought a lot of anger all over the world. I don't know that he is a Muslim in the first place, uh, but even if he was, this book by itself is enough to make him not only kafir but one of the worst kuffar because he was brutally attacking the Quran and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But that's not the point. The person, the man was known for his uh, novel writing and this was his fourth uh, accomplishment. So his prior accomplishments had nothing to do with Islam. So what, what, just to put things in context that this person is known to be a novelist um, a well-known writer in Britain. So he is known in his media, in his own area of his specialty. 1989, just the next year, uh, the, the, the highest ranking Shia Imam uh, Khomeini has made a fatwa to call for his death. So he said that uh, his blood is free and anyone can kill him or should kill him if, if he can. And since then, there were multiple assassination attempts to kill this guy, this man, Salman Rushdie. Regardless of how this is linked to a Shia or non-Shia, whether Salman himself was originally from a Shia family, that's all not re relevant to the topic that I would like to discuss in this khutbah. What I wanted to say is that after he made this book, uh, it was just known within the area of expertise, which is like no novelists. But because of this fatwa of Khomeini, he, the, the, that book became viral. And actually many people who didn't even want to read this book became so eager to know what is inside this book. So as if it was a free advertisement that was given to this person. 
Now, does he, does he uh, deserve that? Doesn't he deserve that? Well, that's irrelevant. But we're talking about facts or uh, factual events that, has happened, uh, that have happened in the past. Something that we really need to learn about in, in, our, in our today's time. Many times he was, people try to, to um, kill him or assassinate him and the UK police has actually uh, covered him throughout the whole past time. He changed his, not his name, he was undercover, he, um, he was hidden. And then just lately when things became more neutral, uh, he started to appear again to the media. Just a few days ago, uh, this person was invited to one of the institutions in New York to give uh, a, 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 a series of lectures. And upon him walking on the stage for the very first lecture of his series, a guy in his 20s went up and stabbed him with a knife, beaded him in, until they, they, they were able to get in, uh, things in control. Uh, apparently, Salman Rushdie is still alive, uh, but what happened right next to that, they have announced that the most popular and the bestseller book throughout the past week was Satanic Verses. And the guy who killed him or tried to kill him was a, uh, a 20 -ish, uh, years old from Lebanon, um, happened to be here or raised here, and he was also from the Shia. Now, regardless of whether how this has anything to do with the Shia, the, the issue here is that after, after Khomeini made his blood free, everyone just went uh, like uh, went to or everyone tried to to learn and uh, read the book of satanic verses and then people forgot about him like how many years over maybe 25 30 years everyone forgot about him and now a guy who perhaps has wanted to answer the call of the Khomeini went ahead and tried to assassinate him. And just after that, in one week, this book, who, the, which was forgotten, became the most popular, the bestseller book. Those are all facts. This is not opinion. And I hope that we, we take a listen from this and just uh, see this, those facts in our life and try to understand how things, how the dynamics really work. In today's time, brothers and sisters, what really works is the, is the strong argument. What really works is the right advertisement. What really works is being a role model, is being a, a person who can convince others. That type, things of like, uh, you know, killing and executing people, revenging from people, it is, is an old thing. It's not this time. This world in today's time doesn't work with this. The, the minute that people start to physically attack each other, it's when you lose the battle. It's when you lose everything that you perhaps could otherwise have achieved. And we see that it's very unfortunate that um, we had a person like Salman Rushdie, who was very well known in, as a novelist, and for the past 30 years, we, the Muslims, could have produced dozens of, no, of strong Muslim novelists who can beat him in his own art. But we didn't get that. Instead, we just got attempts of assassination. And every time this person or, or similar people get this assassination attempt, they became popular. 
They become popular and people even try to read for them or, or about them and read their, their, their uh, products more than any time before. And we are losing and losing and losing. It's very sad that our reaction is motiva motivated most of the time by emotions. Like we love Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu We are willing to go and protest like thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, if not even millions, all over the world every time that someone attacks Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But we are only good at a very short time. We're not good at planning. We're not good at putting together a right plan of how we can defend Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in a very convincing way. People are not waiting to see who would win a battle. These days, people are waiting for a person to convince them. A person who can use the media to, to spread the right thing and really have a strong argument. And it's very unfortunate that we're not good at that. We are probably good at other things, um, at making those short-term um, you know, reactional movements, but those do not have that much of impact. Very temporal impact that, that cannot go beyond maybe a few weeks or a few months, or maybe for the best, a year or two. But then everyone forgets. الحمد لله على إحسانه والشكر له على توفيقه وامتنانه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله تعظيما لشانه وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الداعي إلى رضوانه اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. I really would like to balance this خطبة and I want to say one side of it and I want to say the other side. The other side is a very sad thing that we have heard perhaps a few weeks ago, uh, about the death of one of more, our most beloved mashayikh and du'at, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, rahimahullah ta'ala. Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, I knew him since 1999, the very first time that we met together at Al-Huda. Uh, both of us came to teach uh, at this school, this beloved and, and very great uh, uh, school. Uh, and we used to actually alternate between the same classrooms. Our offices were just next to each other. We used to lead to Raweeh there. And subhanAllah, it was among my best memories in the whole lifetime. Few years that we spent together there. He was just coming back from Medina. He did his bachelor in Islamic studies from the University of, uh, Islamic University of Medina. And he came back, Sheikh Safi Khan, Jazakallah Khair, had met with him perhaps at Hajj, and they uh, worked together to bring him here to, to teach at Al Huda. Everyone who got the pleasure and honor to be his student, mashallah, you see him, you see them great da'iyat here. Uh, we have some of them probably now praying with us in this masjid. Um, his wife, Sister Ambar, uh, I know her family very well, uh, was in my mind, in perhaps in, in all the people that we have seen in, in, in my life and my wife's life, and by the way, she is, I think, from, from Pakistan origin, uh, or India or Pakistan origin. This lady, to the best of my knowledge, has been, was the best educator and best mother that I have ever seen in my life. The, the, the way that she has raised her children, uh, and my children too, because we spent over six years in Ottawa, and my children used to go and, and sit with her, um, along with her uh, children. It was the, the best ever experience that I, my children ever had and that, that I have ever seen in my life. And mashallah, this person, when he first came here with his wife, 
um, he, he started to teach at El Huda, and many of the kids started to really uh, show impact. But then he had a very strong vision where he said, perhaps I can help those kids, but perhaps I can help others who might be in more desperate need of me. And those are the teenagers and the college uh, level students. And he started a program where he went to MSAs uh, at different high schools and different colleges. Um, and I still remember the time when he went one to, uh, to uh, I think it was Georgetown or George, uh, George Washington University, and he met with, with the students there, and everyone was like, this is the first time ever in life to see uh, a sheikh who speaks eloquently, he speaks, who speaks English like native speakers very eloquently, and at the same time who has got this level of education, and at the same time who has this charisma. Uh, like very, very, very attractive person, mashallah. And that actually was the beginning of his journey. I still remember that he used to spend a long time after the hours, uh, working hours, to plan for what, he, what, what, is, what in the future became as the Maghrib Institute. And I remember one day, I, I was about to leave Al Huda, and I saw him like droning in, in like some, some courses that he was taking online. I asked him, Muhammad, what are you doing? He said, I'm taking a course. I said, could you tell me what that is? He said, you're, you're not gonna get it. I said, please tell me what it is. He said, it's inter entrepreneurship. And I was like, what is this word? What does this word mean? Entrepreneurship was his target from that day. That was 1999, by the way, brothers and sisters. 19, almost 1999. Entrepreneurship was the, the, the target of Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif at the time when he just came back from Medina. And that was for him, his, he made a, a mission statement at that time, I still remember it. He said, I believe that our youth here in America, in North America are missing a person who can teach them Islam in a way that they can accept it in America or in Canada, meaning in a modern way, not in the very old fashioned way that people see in Mecca, Medina or any of those um, traditional institutions. And that's when he started the very first Al Maghrib class, he did it in the um, basement of Al Huda School. And I still remember there were about 64 people there. 64 people who registered for the very first class of his, Rahimahullah. Uh, Muhammad and I became like soulmates for a long time, went to Ottawa and found him there. We moved together there and we spent like about six years over there. And I always get very surprised at the, his determination, his planning, and mashallah, his perfect work, his perfect products. Regardless of where he went and regardless of what direction he moved in, in the past couple of years, but I think the thing that everyone recognized is that he was the very first person in the whole North America, perhaps in the whole entire world, to start a concept of teaching Islamic education in a very modern way and reach out to this um, uh, uh, sector of like the, the teenagers and the college um, students and college graduates in, in, in a very efficient way. He was the very first person to start thinking about, can I make a very condensed course in two weekends that's his idea. Like, no, it wasn't there. Like a course, Islamic course means that you have to spend day and night for maybe several, several weeks or even several months. He was like, okay, I know in America we, people cannot do this. And I, I, will, I need to stop the bleeding. So how could I do it? And he came up with this idea and he came up with that vision and plan. He started Al Maghrib, one of the most successful Organ, Islamic or teaching organization, not only in America, actually worldwide. 
it teaches at, in, in Australia, in, in, in uh, India, in Asia, in, in Africa, everywhere, in Europe and here, mashallah, they, they, they have hundreds of thousands of, of, of students, uh, like active students that, that are benefiting from this. And mashallah, he then later included several mashayikh that we perhaps know most of them. And, and, and then he went to Dubai and he passed away there all of a sudden. It was, um, I think, two weeks ago or three weeks ago when he passed away. And um, subhanAllah, I got the chance to um, meet with his father just three days after his death. Um, he was uh, praying Salat al-Isha at home with his family and he uh, fell down with uh, a heart attack. Uh, until the ambulance came, he was done. Uh, he was gone. And, and subhanAllah, there was nothing prior to that that indicates that he will be uh, losing his life. And subhanAllah, rahmatullahi alayhi, uh, his last action was his prayer. Rahmatullah. The, the, the thing that I, I really want to emphasize here is that this person had the courage had the planning, had the, um, um, the uh, determination, and he made it. And he impacted, wallahi, hundreds of thousands of people that I know. I have been working in many uh, uh, computers, computer uh, organizations or companies, like big ones, and and I see, I see the, the, the young ones who are joining the companies, like Microsoft, like uh, um, Amazon, like um, all, all these different ones. And I see the impact of Muhammad al-Sharif on them. That was a, a big lesson learned. Now, people say, but Muhammad al-Sharif is, uh, is a very unique product. Yes, it is unique. Uh, but that's the product that we want. That, that's, how we can, that's how we can work with all the attack. That's how we can defeat the attacks that are going against Muslims. Like compare what Muhammad Sharif was able to do to the person who tried to uh, stab uh, Salman Rushdie just a few days ago. What Muhammad Sharif was able to do was to bring hundreds of thousands to the knowledge of Islam and at least make them love it. What that guy was able to do was to make the Satanic Verses book the most popular book in the world. That's the difference. That's the only one difference. But I really want to finish or conclude this Jum'ah with something that is more heart-touching uh, to me and perhaps to everyone. And that is about not Muhammad Sharif, about how Muhammad Sharif was raised in his young, young time, which is, I believe that every one of us could do. There's no excuse for any one of us not to work hard on planning and, and motivating themselves, their family members, their children, their neighbors, their beloved ones, we can do a lot. I know Muhammad Shari's father for over 25 years now. I know him very well. And frankly speaking, I love him and I got along with him more than I did with Muhammad Sharif, even though I consider him as a soulmate. Uh, the father of Muhammad Sharif His name is, uh, the father of Muhammad Sharif, uh, name is Hilmi Sharif. And uh, he lives now in Ottawa. He's a very humble, down-to-earth person. Like you can't really, you can't really know him unless, unless there is, uh, or you can't really observe him uh, out of the crowd unless you know him from, 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 from a before time. I went to visit him and uh, his, his wife, the mother of Muhammad Sharif, and my, my wife was with me. 
So we sat together. I sat with the father. My wife sat with the mother, separate area. And we talked about what Muhammad al-Sharif meant to them. And I want to share with you three things. The first one is that his father uh, very, uh, was very uh, impacted emotionally. But he told me, look around you, Abdul Rahman, in this whole house. Everything here is something that Muhammad al-Sharif bought from his own pocket, from his own money. And there was never a time that we asked for something or we need something, except that he would make sure that it will be delivered to us. Although Muhammad Sharif lived in Dubai and they live in, 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 in Ottawa. So that's number one. And number two, I asked him, um, what, uh, how, how, how do you feel about Muhammad? He was like, he was the light that we can see through in this life. And I lost my eyes by losing him. And the third thing, I asked him, could you share with me anything that you have done for him to bring him to become that person? Now, very humble man. He told me, we, in the, in the early childhood of Muhammad, we lived in a city called Winter, uh, Winnipeg. They call it, by, for joke, Winterpeg. It's one of the cities that uh, actually has a uh, most severe winter in Canada, Winnipeg. And he told me that he, his big mission, his whole mission was to bring his child, Muhammad, to the masjid every single day. But not only that. His most important thing that he, he said that has impacted Muhammad was to make him love, help the Muslims. And he gave me example of this. He said, at the time, we used, in the, win the very winter, like very severe winter days, we used to go to the masjid about half an hour before Adhan al-Fajr. What to do in order to uh, uh, clean the path or shovel the ice, at the snow, so that the pathway uh, the driveway for the people coming to the masjid will become clean. And Muhammad, in his early childhood, as you know, in winter time, uh, people, especially youngsters, don't like to get out of their bed, especially for the Fajr time, especially if it is too early, especially if it is too windy or too cold. But he used to get him, and, he, and, and people used to thank him very much for shoveling the, the, the path or the driveway of the masjid. From that, he learned how to serve Muslims. And the love that was, was um, that planted in his heart to do something that can benefit the Muslims. His father and his mother are very, very, very regular Egyptian family. Very regular. You can't, you can't even... Uh, here, you, you can even always hear the Egyptian accent. But Muhammad became very perfect in his education, in his eloquency, mashallah, in his speech, like, like, like no one. And subhanAllah, that was um, a, a, one of the examples that he, he, he mentioned about how he managed to to raise this, this young man and then all the way until he convinced him that Muhammad, we have very minimal numbers of, of Americans or Canadians who have learned or who have gone through a professional Islamic education program. And that was behind him, Muhammad, leaving Canada, going to Medina to do his bachelor degree in Islamic studies. But when he came back, he had the love to serve the Muslims. He had the professionalism that he has learned from early childhood. And then he had the education that he really needed. And mashallah, with all the determination that he had, he made that impact. And I asked myself and everyone here, 
Couldn't we do anything to our kids? Couldn't we do anything to our children to at least set the stage for them? So that one day, inshallah, we will have not only one Muhammad Sharif, we will have hundreds, if not thousands, of Muhammad Sharif and better than Muhammad Sharif. Those are the ones who can spread Islam. Those are the ones who can, who can defend Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Those are the ones who, can, who, who we can be very proud of producing. That's how we can change, brothers and sisters. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama salli ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama barak ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna ka hamidu majid Allahumma ya Rabbana alimna ma infa'na wa fa'na ma alamtana wa zidna ilma Allahumma inna nas'aluka ya Rahman wa Rahim ya qiyum al-samawat wal-adhin an taghfira li akhila Muhammad Allahumma ya Rabbana irfa' darajatahu fi al-mahdiyin wa khlufhu fi aqibihi fi al-ghabirin واغفر لنا وله أجمعين اللهم يا ربنا ارفع درجاته في عليين اللهم يا ربنا جازه بالحسنات إحسانا وبالسيئات عفوا وغفرانا اللهم يا ربنا وارحمنا برحمتك إذا صرنا إلى ما صار إليه يا رب العالمين عباد الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم الجليل يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة